Greetings, this is Doc Ock coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central this afternoon with another installment of Doc Ock at noon and nine. And we've got some uh, more stories to tell of Norma Marceray, a um, former Kent State student, a Kent State alumna from way black in the 1920s and what was life like on the campus of Kent State and matter of fact, in the town of Kent itself. What was life like way black then? So we're gonna be sharing some more stories from her, but before we go there, let's go to Shushu Moko Jumbi. The land of look behind and see what uh, Sister Althea Romeo has to say to share with us today. The other day we read about a black man. Today, let's read about a black woman. Today's selection is Miss Benbo. Miss Bimbo, you looking nice today, Miss Bimbo. It looked like you done ready for a show. Red skirt, red shirt, new shoes and new hat. Matching his layers and layers and layers of fat to hold up all of that. When you bounce them waves, do follow like a barrel full of psychedelic jello. You like a whole troop moving at one time, but the only thing now and then some the fat step out of line. You bottom half bouncing like a big red ball, especially when you pass by your cousin's stall. You hand them swinging like two leg of mutton in the air and your two feet trudging like a bulldozer me dare. Well, what is this I see here today? It looked like the whole carnival turned loose when Miss Bimbo get way. The more you dance, the more you expand. And now you look like two troops instead of one. Well, I have to see you later, my dear. I see another carnival troop coming up here. <laughs> Miss Benbo. Okay. Interesting. I hope she um, changed the names. The name of that person. Because she so put her out there on Front Street, Miss Benbo. We have to call and talk to Althea and see what is the story exactly behind Miss Benbo. Because that was an interesting one right there. Meanwhile, we're going to return to um, the story of Norma Marceray. Let's see where she's where we left off at. Yeah. Okay. So we were talking about uh, culture shock. That's where we were. We were talking about culture shock. In the book, The Fences Between by Norma Marceray, a young lady from Canton, Ohio, who came to Kent in the year 1920. Eight, I believe it was, 28 or 29. Came here in, in 28 or 29 and went to school for a few years. We've been going back in the record books, matter of fact, looking for her photograph in the yearbook. We have yet to find Miss Norma Snipes or Norma Marceray as she was known, but we're still looking. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and read what she had to say about her time here at Kent State University. I began to make resolutions. I began to write letters home to mom and the kids to let them know I would come home some weekend, especially when the Joneses had Sunday chitlin dinners. Oh, yes. She did not want to be there for the chitlin dinner. Even if I attempted to describe the food, no one at home would know what I was talking about. In the meantime, I absented myself from the Jones home as much as possible. 
I would awaken at 6.30 a.m. and head for school by 7 with a small packed lunch of a peanut butter sandwich and two or three cookies. I remained at the college later than most non-dormitory students studying in the library or an empty classroom in Kent Hall. When I figured the Joneses' supper hour was over, I returned home to prepare my evening meal, which usually consisted of a kind of beans or vegetable soup and a boiled potato. The right amount of water to a kind of soup could be very filling. I learned to drink cups and cups of coffee to keep awake while I studied. It was difficult to concentrate in the gas-heated dining room area with three people conversing about local gossip. The Jones' 20-year-old son, Alvin, came in from work, ate a hurried supper, and went out on the street. He gave the impression of not really living at home at all. My college assignments were not like the high school homework or even that of Canton College Center. I had to exert a new kind of discipline and concentration. Many evenings I started studying after the Joneses had retired and continued studying until midnight. Mrs. Jones warned me she'd raise my rent if I continued to study after 10 p.m. The college have a lights out time too, she reminded me. Just when my money was running very low, I saw an ad in the daily paper for an evening cleaning woman at one of Kent's largest beauty shops. I applied for it and was hired. The pay would be 75 cents an hour, and it was possible that I could earn $3 a week. This would pay my room rent of $2 and allow $1 for food. This beauty shop job was not on the dean's list of quote-unquote approved places of employment, but it paid 25 cents an hour more than the college recommendation of 50 cents an hour. I got behind in my room rent. The overwhelming urge to escape a nauseating and often morose Saturday and Sunday weekend was more compelling than paying my room rent, which was the exact train fare home to Canton. By the end of the winter quarter, Mrs. Jones threatened to report this fact to the Dean of Girls, along with my unauthorized evening employment. I was in a strange, strange world, a disconcerting real-life situation, an earlier curiosity about a different environmental lifestyle had been satiated. Oh, yes, satiated. She knew all she wanted to know about different lifestyles of black folks. College life. What do I remember most about my matriculation at Kent Normal College? Fun and excitement? Friends? Uh, parties? None of the above. There was always the shortage of money. A nagging fear activated a concern that if I did not remain at Kent and did not return the next quarter, my goal to graduate and become a teacher would be more than temporarily postponed. It would be decisively aborted. That concern kept me going. Dean Verder set the stage for the unpleasant environmental complications by placing me outside the realm of intimate dormitory experiences. Nevertheless, except for the physical ed classes, school was quite rewarding. Learning has always created a sense of excitement within me to read a book, to listen to a lecture, to absorb new facts, to exchange ideas, to experiment with materials, to be challenged by a new viewpoint was like an adventurous journey. Not all of my classes, not all of my teachers were super. One good exceptional teacher, however, could make it worth my while to be in school every day and to absorb something even from a mediocre teacher. Of the nearly 70 or more different teachers I had from grade school through the second year of college, only a dozen or so stood out as exceptional. They were the teachers whose professional 
enthusiasm, whose encouragement and high expectations carried over to the next class, the next year, and the next challenge. I began college with four high school years of perfect attendance. I set a goal of perfect college attendance, too. I nearly missed that perfect record when a junior, when as a junior in high school, mom insisted that I, not Ethel, stay home to care for my younger sisters. Six-year-old Ruth and four-year-old Virginia. Ruth was recovering from a recurring chest carbuncle, which caused her to fret and demand attention. Virginia was never ill. It is not my wish to keep you out of school, but I need the work, and the girls must be looked after. You can study your lessons at home. You will not get behind. I shall write a note to your teachers and tell them of this emergency, Mom explained apologetically. Mom left the house to board the 736th Street trolley to the square. She would arrive at her job by 8 a.m. Ethel, Eugene, and Carl would leave for school a few minutes after Mom's departure. I had to think fast. I was determined not to be counted absent from school. Since I, like my father, could walk a mile in 10 minutes, I could leave the house at 8 or 8.05, be at school no later than 8.15, being present for homeroom exercises. I could then go down to the office with a note requesting permission to leave school because of a family emergency. Mom had taught me how to sign her name on Pop's money order support checks so the note I could write, I would write, would look authentic. After surrounding Ruth and Virginia with an assortment of small playthings, I told them I had to go to Robert's Grocery, four blocks away, to get some food for lunch. Be real good, and Mr. Roberts is sure to give me some candy for each of you. If I am a little bit late, don't worry. You know how Mr. Roberts likes to talk. With that, I hurried from the house and headed for McKinley High. After making my presence known to my homeroom teacher, I was given permission to speak to several of my teachers and explain the emergency, which required my going home. The forged excuse was on file in the attendance office. By 9 a.m., I was back home and not a moment too soon because mom phoned to ask, is everything all right? Yeah. My younger sisters never missed me. They never questioned why Mr. Roberts did not send them a penny treat. My perfect school attendance continued. The health and physical education curriculum at Kent State revived all of the incidents and feelings that caused me to faint when gymnastics was a requirement in high school. I seldom had a gym partner and never had a swimming partner. The girls would chatter and giggle with a friendly intimacy in the locker rooms, then run jubilantly to the gym floor. Grab a friend and line up for games and exercises. I was always the la always the girl, always the girl without a partner. Unless there happened to be a least preferable white girl left to be my reluctant teammate. On those occasions, we would stand there, each of us in our own thoughts, afraid to smile, forced to accept the fact we were undesirables afraid to um, trap to perform together for that class period. In high school, I pretended a faint and sudden illness to cover my anger and humiliation. If I tried that at Kent, I feared I'd be taken to the infirmary and my pretense would be exposed. How I wished the gym instructor would assign us as assign us partners by some method which would de- emphasize our physical appearance or our personal preferences. After gym class one morning, the instructor called me aside and explained there was another colored girl at the college. Would you mind, Norma, if I had your schedules changed so that you and Velma could be in the same class? She appears so lonesome. And that way, you both, I ain't even hear the rest of what he had to say. 
my mind flashed back to other situations when teachers found unpaired Negro students to be a dilemma. One in two scattered Negro students in college presented the same problem as the 10 to 15 Negro students at McKinley High School. Why? That's all I have to say about that. Why? One teacher came up to me in my sophomore year and asked if I would like to transfer to another biology lab, period. We have the nicest colored girl there and she really needs a partner. We try to do our lab experiments in twos. Don't you know? I have a very good partner, I explained. Ben Epi and I work well together. I don't want to change. We take turns with other partners in our class and everything, I explained. She looked at me and that kind, patronizing smile disappeared as she walked away. But now that my college physical education teacher was asking for favors, I'd ask one too. While you're changing the schedules to put us in the same class, could it be the last period of the day on Friday? How about that? I think so, she replied. Come by my office tomorrow for your new schedule. Mm. She had already decided. That way I reasoned I could hurry home after class, finish shampooing my hair, dry it, press it properly. I dreaded revealing the fluffiness of my hair after water had seeped under the swimming cap and returned my hair to its natural, expansive state. Velma and I became good partners, but we did poorly as swim teachers for each other. In the swimming class, the instructor never touched Velma or me. She never took hold of our hands, never held our bodies to show us how to float or how to perfect a particular technique like she did dozens of other girls showed no concern for our progress whatsoever. Yet, I understood we were expected to swim across the pool, master certain strokes, or fail the course. I made a D in swimming, the first near-failing grade of 14 years of schooling. And we'll end right there. We'll be black, continuing her story tomorrow. Because as you can see, it's getting interesting. Because I'm sure many of you out there have recollections of experiences just like this or very similar to this. And as a matter of fact, even for myself, I recall as a teacher being in the gym class, teaching gym classes in local schools here in Akron recently. And it wasn't about the black and the white thing. But I know that when you have children choose up sides to be on a team to play whatever game or, you know, uh, activity you want to do, there are some that are more favorable than others. Everybody wants Joe Schmo on the team, but they don't want Dorothy, whoever. So, therefore, I wouldn't have them. And it takes so much time because they're sitting there trying to decide who's going to be on their team. You pick two team captains, they take forever. So I, it was a very simple thing to just say, look, here's how we're going to do it. You're number one, you're number two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. All the ones go over here, all the twos go over there. We're done. We're done with that. It's really very, very simple to deal with an issue like that. And that would have settled the whole thing. But those teachers didn't do anything like that. Not that they didn't never thought of it, but if they did think of it, they certainly did not implement it. And we won't go into the reasons for that. I'll let you ruminate on that for a little while until I see you again. So this is Doc Ock signing off for today. Remember, we will be black tonight with more scary stories. Matter of fact, we're going to be finishing up the story of the monkey's paw. So be here for the end of the monkey paw story. We'll see how that one goes. And maybe we'll even start a new one. Meanwhile, you know what we need you to do. Go ahead and subscribe to the Tubular Black Facts channel. There's a button below. All you got to do is hit it and quit it. It's quite painless and easy to do. And in the meanwhile, I'm just going to give away to 
Connie. I was thinking about you the other day, Connie. Good to see you out there. And I give wave to Esther and anybody else that's out there. We're waving to all of y'all. And we will be black tonight with more scary stories. And by the way, our scary stories are stories that you haven't heard before, more than likely. We're telling stories of old Hig and the Sukiyans and uh, the Jumbies and Doopies and things like that, Hanks, and things that go bump in the night from the black hand side. So be here. Take a ride. See if we scare you or not. In the meanwhile, peace out, without a doubt. Of course, with justice, because anything less disgusts us.